start? Yes, sir. So good evening again. Uh, good evening, everyone, and very warm welcome to each one of you for sparing time out of your busy schedules and for uh, you know choosing to be with us on Saturday evening. So uh, good evening again, and thank you so much for accepting the invitation for this scientific program. Uh, I'm Dr. Kalyani. I'm reaching out to you on behalf of AstraZeneca Oncology team, and today we are going to have one and a half hour of intensive scientific uh, discussion where we will dwell into the complex landscape of EGFR mutated NSCLC treatment options. And for this, we have assembled a very distinguished panel of experts across India. So we have uh, HCPs from different states and we are going to have an intense discussion under the guidance of Dr. Bivas Biswas. Again, if I have to introduce Dr. Bivas, then uh, sir needs no introduction. Sir is uh, very experienced, more than two decades of experience now. Sir has been instrumental in uh, for working for his contributions in Tata Memorial Hospital, Kolkata, and now sir is associated with Apollo Hospital, Kolkata. And uh, sir has also been one of the principal investigators for Flora 2 trial. So I welcome you all again, and I request Bivas sir to uh, take the lead further. Thank you, Dr. Kajani, for the introduction, and very good evening, everyone, for joining this webinar. And thanks uh, the organizer for giving me this opportunity to moderate this uh, session in the presence of our esteemed faculty, both national and international level. So um, just to start the context, we are treating EGFR mutated advanced uh, NSCLC over the last uh, few years. And, and then there have been a rapid development in terms of therapeutic strategy, first line, second line. Now we have plethora of options. So, there comes the role of customized treatment planning and also optimum sequencing in each patient with advanced NSCLC with each one mutation. And we all know that the TKI treatment now moving is moved to early stage and we are eagerly waiting also on the stage C post CTI setting on the TKI maintenance strategy. So, and very recently we have the data on probably all hour about that with a KMO and TKI strategy starting from the JFT Nivera, now I moved to the OC Martin Nivera, and data looks quite exciting. So a good time both for clinician and mostly the patients. So with this context, we'll start, uh, we have few couple of um, a presentation followed by case-based uh, case presentation and discussion uh, for the next 90 minutes. So I'll invite my first speaker, uh, Dr. Shushan Mittal. Uh, Dr. Shushant will be talking on the role of liquid biopsy in adverse NSC. This is one of the important topic. Uh, already it is established topic and I think is this use is going to be very crucial in future um, coming years. Dr. Shushant is my former colleague from AIMS and is a director and senior consultant in Department of Medical Oncology in Max Hospital, Shalimarma, Delhi. So I'll welcome Dr. Shushan to give his deliberation and one request to each speaker, uh, try to stick to the time. So Shushan, welcome on board. Very good evening and you may go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bivas, for the kind introduction and thank you, AstraZeneca. So uh, uh, please share my slides. So lung cancer is one of the malignancies which has, which I think all of us have seen how the treatment paradigm has changed and how translational medicine from bench to bedside has been utilized in lung cancer. We had just uh, uh, squamous cell or adenocarcinoma and from there we have come up to molecular level uh, bio biology, pathology and pdl one immunotherapy and now we are going ahead with the treatment modalities as when the patient has lived longer, three years, four years, and then he develops resistance to these therapies, how to go about it. And from solid biopsies, the role of liquid biopsy in advanced NSCLC, what I'll be talking about. Next slide. So this is the overview, liquid biopsy, new way forward, then the application of liquid biopsy, what is the data, tissue versus plasma outcome, then role of liquid biopsy in minimal residual disease, just like in any liquid hematological malignancies, uh, the in solid tumors also MRD is coming up and then I'll summarize. Next slide. So talking about liquid biopsy, a new way forward. Next slide. It says that 
majority of the diseases now are defined by the molecular pathology the molecular pathologists play a very important role in diagnosing and planning the treatment for the patients we have these various mutations starting from egfr till about mec1 the plethora of molecular test what we have in our armamentarium but how to go about it next slide so in current era the challenges of a tissue biopsy are may five major challenges first is the biopsy is not visible the sample collection is not proper there's quantity or the tissue is an issue second is delayed or inaccurate staging and improper tissue sampling third the biomarker is not standardized routine practice still we have third tier cities second tier cities where these biomarkers are not performed as the reflex testings are not done and when we get the patient from such cities how the tissue is not available or the tissue has been depleted or these tests have not been done the patient has to undergo a repeat biopsy the patient is not willing and these biomarker testing the standardization of the labs low test sensitivity prolonged turn around time the anxiety in the patient and the relatives as what is the report how to start the treatment and definitely reporting after all these things how to report and how as clinicians what is important to go through the report what is important to analyze the molecular pathologist helps us to do that so even in europe the insufficient tissue provided was one of the major causes that the molecular testing was not done and second was inadequate tissue quality so these are the unmet needs in tissue biopsies next slide so a detailed analysis was done and it was shown that 20% of the patient cannot undergo tissue biopsy either it is deep seated or the chances of pneumothorax or the morbidity is such that patient cannot undergo and 3% of the patients refuse to undergo the biopsy because they think that if we touch the tissue it will get agitated the tissue, the cancer cells will spread and they will rapidly spread second as i told you the quality and the quantity of the tissue is very less uh, whether it has been processed adequately whether the time taken to process is within the guidelines or no and the adequate quantity of the dna and as well as the quality is what we sometimes um, face because we get the report that the tissue the dna could not be taken out it could it could not be cultured enough to have the report so overall the tissue biopsy failure rate may range up to 40% which is significant next slide and also in tissue biopsy the one shot tissue sample might not reflect the entire tumor landscape what it means that we have the bag full of rice the grains and the pulses and we take out the pulses and we cannot say that the bag is full of pulses it has the rice and the grains also so that tumor heterogeneity is one of the major causes of resistance even the patient starts uh progressing after the initial response so that is what is being shown that the shades of t790m mutation is t7 uh, is in egfr mutant lung cancer is one of the major causes of uh resistance and that is because of the intra tumor heterogeneity which we face in the tumor biopsy next slide so to overcome the method is liquid biopsy the advantages is that the tissue related challenges can be mitigated the turnaround time is reduced and the chances of detection of actionable mutations also improves so this is important to be discussed in mdt where the interventional radiologist the pulmonologist molecular biologist molecular pathologist all are there in the tumor board and are on the same platform sometimes what happens the pulmonologist does a bronchoscopy and does a fnac the invasive procedure has been done and fnac has been done but the tissue is not adequate to do the biopsy so that's why a pulmonologist and the interventional radiologist need to be told that we need the tissue adequate tissue in spite of that in a country like in uh, india where are we have so such a big country we still face these challenges next slide 
So liquid biopsy, what it does is that the secretors, they secrete the tumor DNA into the blood and we collect the tissue, we collect the blood and we segregate the tumor DNA or circulating DNA. And hence, we are able to do this deletions, insertions, point mutations, amplifications, translocation, and chromosomal abrasions. All these tests can be done on circulating DNA. Hence, it is much more beneficial by to do a liquid biopsy. Next slide. So the rationale of integrating in the routine management is liquid biopsy may be useful in patients who are not willing for biopsy or they are, the tissue is deep-seated. It is difficult for an interventional radiologist or a pulmonologist to do a biopsy. The scarcity of the tumor tissue can be overcome if the liquid biopsy sample is available. It may spare the patients from additional invasive procedure in two settings. First, if the patient has undergone an FNAC, the tissue is inadequate for the further testing, or there is a recurrence and patient doesn't want to undergo the biopsy again. So liquid biopsy provides us a faster molecular analysis. The turnaround time may be shorter. The circulating DNA is recommended if the turnaround time for the tissue biopsy is more than two weeks. So all these parameters, all these advantages are there of liquid biopsy over a tumor tissue biopsy. Next slide. So pros and cons, minimally invasive access, tumor inter and intra heterogeneity, turnaround time, treatment monitoring, and serial access and multiple samples can be done. The disadvantage is the clinical validation is missing especially in country like India, where are so many labs are there, but we don't know which lab to be trusted, which lab has uh, the quality assurance. The sensitivity, dilute and low amounts of tumor DNA or the germline contamination, how to analyze that germline contamination by a physician needs to be taught by a molecular pathologist, highly fragmented sample and short half-life until it is purified. So these are the disadvantages of a liquid biopsy. Next slide. So second is application of liquid biopsy. This, this was all the uh, hypothesis or the what the thought behind the liquid biopsy is there. Now the application, what the data says about liquid biopsy versus tissue biopsy. Next slide. So this Nile study is one of the landmark studies in which a prospective real one analysis was there, was done for metastatic lung cancer about 282 patients met the inclusion criteria and they were evaluated for the impact of circulating DNA genotype on the patient's first-line treatment choice for metastatic NACLC. Next slide. Next slide. And it showed that when a tissue biopsy is done, 21 patients were picked up. When circulating DNA was done, 27% of the patient were picked up. And all these EGFR, ALK, ROS, BRAF, BRAF, RET, EBR2, MET, exon, skipping, and amplification, all these could be picked up by doing the test. And if we see the uh, patients who were positive on tissue, the circulating DNA also picked them, 48 patients out of 60. So almost 80% concordance was there. And we could also pick more mutations by doing a circulating DNA. You can see those uh, horizontal histograms, 67% on tissue and 87% on circulating DNA. Next slide. We have this Indian data also by uh, my friend Bivas and Dr. Ghansham, who both are present in this panel, that they had also conducted a study and found out that in Indian scenario also, plasma and tissue testing, the condense rate was 80%, which is as per the Nile study. Next slide. Another study, Aura 3, in which patients of EGFR who were treated with first generation or second generation TKI and had progressed, they were randomized into 2 is 2 1 osimertinib versus chemotherapy. Next slide. And they were taken up for tissue biopsy and liquid biopsy both. Next slide. Next slide. And the analysis showed that patients who had 
tissue T790 mutations, about 50% of the patients on the liquid biopsy plasma also, we were able to pick them by T790 mutations. And patients who were negative, 77% of the patients who were negative on plasma were also negative on tissue. So 50% of the patients we were able to diagnose by liquid biopsy on patients who would refuse for repeat biopsy or the biopsy could not be done. If we see the next two uh, columns, exon 19 and L858R, 98%, 99% chances that we were able to uh, pick up the patients on, uh, on these uh, mutations. Next slide. So when these mutations of liquid biopsy picked up T790M mutation, it was also tested whether these were really clinically significant. So patients on tumor tissue when given osimertinib showed a median PFOS of 10.1 versus 4.1 with PF with hazard ratio of 0 0.30. And on the right side, the PFS of the patient who were diagnosed in plasma was 0.42 to hazard ratio with PFS of 8.2, which was similar to tumor. So it gives us the confidence that even if we are able to do a plasma T790M mutation and they are positive, these patients will re respond to osimertinib as this is the drug of choice for these category of patients. Next slide. So we had the hypothesis. We had we have the uh, we have the uh, evidence of international and Indian studies to collaborate to tell us that liquid biopsy, how it can be helpful. Now the third is minimal residual disease, the role of liquid biopsy. Next slide. At present, lung cancer patients are treated and then radiological recurrence, when happens, then patients are diagnosed for recurrence. However, if we are able to pick patients before the clinical and radiological recurrence, that would be a really boon for such kind of patients. So the future is to detect the disease in the blood before we are able to diagnose on the radiological clinical basis. Next slide. So MRD can be identified by detection of circulating DNA in the plasma cell. Majority of the circulating DNA are normal germline mutations, but these red ones which are circulating tumor DNA are small fractions. They are present in the blood plasma and highly sensitive methods are necessary to measure the circulating DNA. Next slide. So these two studies, Tracer X, in which 24 lung cancer patients after the surgery were evaluated, in which about 14 patients were MRD positive and they had 93% of these patients experienced recurrence. However, 10 patients who were MRD negative, only 10% of the patients experienced recurrence. Chaudhary et al., another 37 patient study. Again, patients who were positive, 100% of these MRD positive patient recurred, and 17 patients which were MRD negative, only 6% recurred. So what it says that after the completion of adjuvant therapy, if you are able to do these MRD analysis, we can probably uh, prognosticate the patient. I don't know whether we would like to change the therapy or how we go about it. We don't have the guidelines. That's why in future, uh, we'll be able to have a better guideline as to if MRD positive patient is there after completion of adjuvant therapy, what is to be done. Next slide. So this is what I told you. Next slide. So this is beautifully represents that detection of MRD before the radiological detection. If you are able to diagnose the patient by the MRD test, uh, it would be a great benefit for the patients. Next slide. So the studies are still going on to use CTDN as an adaptive marker to intensify the treatment in advance and CLC. Next slide. So this is the study which is going on in which the screening is done, plasma testing, EGFR is done, and patients are considered for intensification of the treatment if they are MRD positive, uh, chemotherapy with OC1 to be added. So study results are awaited. Next slide. So to summarize, we, the role of liquid biopsy is that a non-invasive method such as liquid biopsy is giving an additive benefit when combined with invasive techniques for diagnosing. 
it has drastically revolutionized the field of clinical oncology, offering ease in tumor sampling, continuous monitoring by repeated sampling, devising personalized therapeutic regimens and screening for therapeutic resistance. It provides a tool for monitoring of therapeutic responses, cancer screening in high-risk population, assessment of tumor heterogeneity, and detection of novel cancer driver mutations. And though it is still evolving, its non-invasive nature promises to open the new eras in clinical oncology. Thank you so much for your patient sharing. Uh, back to the organizers. Thank you, Dr. Shushan, for beautifully discussing the role of liquid bias in different, different aspects of lung cancer. I think this is a very good, exciting time. It's not only for diagnosis uh, for molecular alteration. I think the major role will come in molecular response monitoring and also at MRD post resection or let's say post CTRT setting. And maybe in future, we may say, uh, see something like a stop emotive trial. If the patient has very good molecular response, can we stop the TKI, in, at least in selected cases? I think the time will be exciting, just like a hematological malignancy. So thank you once again for this beautiful discussion on um, uh, liquid biopsy in NSCLC. So we'll move to the next talk. Um, Dr. Ganesham Vishwas is our next speaker. Um, and Dr. Ganesham is our senior colleague from consultant medical oncologist, uh, Sparks Hospital, Bhubaneswar. And he will be talking on treating uncommon EGFR mutation. I think this is another important area, not much discussed because we always discuss on the common EGFR mutation because most of the trial is on that. So I think this is one of the untouched area and there are some updates on this. So Raghansham will be talking on this topic. So sir, very good evening and you may proceed. The stage is yours. Thank you. Yeah, good evening and thank you, Dr. Vivash. Thank you, AstraZeneca. So please allow me to share my slide. I think my slides are visible, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. So treating uncommon EGFR mutations in advanced NSCLC. So most of the time we talk about common uh, mutations, but let us see so how things have evolved in EGFR mutations. So lung cancer has been considered as the poster boy in a personalized medicine. And now, so there are many other solid tumors in liquid tumors. So we are looking at a personalized medicine. So we have a tendency to reveal the secret behind everything. And that's what probably the DNA looks like, though we talk about some amount of RNA also in cancers today. The medical progress has been a long way from superstitions to symptoms. Now we talk about signatures and something on molecular is what we are talking about in signatures. So EGFR mutations are, are, are among the most common oncogenic drivers in the non-small cell lung cancer space especially adenocarcinomas, and sometimes you might pick up in also in squamous cell cancers. So these are more common. We know that in the probably the Asian uh, populations and the Southeast Asia, it is said that it's very difficult to kill a Japanese with the advanced lung cancer because the mutation rates are so high. And probably subsequently, we Indians also have a very high amount of EGFR mutations. So today, the mutation, so we know that when we started treating lung cancers and the dry, we are looking at the driver mutation, so we are doing an EGFR algorithm, then, then, then rose. Now, from 5 gene to 12 gene, now the whole panel, so people are going for 500, 600, 1,000 genes. And we still understand that EGFR being the most commonest. And now, KRAS, and so, so around 50% probably, if we chase, then probably we'll have some driver mutations. And in those EGFR space, probably um, uh, the deletion 19 and L8 5 are, which are the most commonest. So in this study, which is being shown in this slide, so 40 other single nucleotide variants are in detected in the EGFR gene. So most such variants are not oncogenic drivers. So like what mutations you pick up in a broad-based NGS, suppose for a 500 and 1000 genes, so they all may not be an oncologist, so they can be a passenger. So do not increase the risk of carcinogenesis or do not impair response with EGFR TKIs. So like this, all the EGFR mutation in the cancer lung are not the same. So if you see this, so these are all well-known billions of Indian Bollywood. And everybody you know that, so they have their own signatures. Even if you don't see their photos by their voice, you can recognize 
that this is probably Ajit or a Danny or Pran. So deletion 19 and L8 fibroidal mutations are the most common, as I said, so to the tune of 90%. And these are known as either a common or a classical or a typical EGFR mutations. Rest 10%, which are less common, is actually a heterogeneous group. And so this can be from 18, 19, 20, 21. And these are known as uncommon or, or atypical mutations. So this is from a cosmic database of 600 or patients way back in May 2016, we showed that probably 90 versus 10%. So today we will focus on this 10% which are uncommon or atypical mutations. So common and uncommon mutations have similar clinical pathological phase. So you may not be able to distinguish, like we talk about a young patient, non-smoker, females, and probably adenocarcinoma, then it might be an EGFR alt, but you cannot separate it that this EGFR will be an atypical or a typical one. So it means, so, but uncommon mutations are generally less sensitive to the available EGFR TK and show less marked response to the treatment with the EGFR TK. So some uncommon mutations sensitize the receptor EGFR TK, otherwise others are non-sensitizing. So if you see this whole plethora of uncommon EGFR mutations starting from exon 18, so it constitutes G719X substitution, it can be A, C, D, and X. So this is, so these are all these uncommon mutations. And, and if next coming to an exon 19, and everybody of us know in exon 19. And uh, so this, the common one is the deletion 19, which is around 60%, which is the commonest one. But again, so these have, so as mentioned, D761, Y, exon 19 insertion and L747P. So these are uncommon mutations in the exon 19. Coming to exon 20, which probably got highlighted because of the Johnson & Johnson drug, that is abimantamab, and also another drug, Mobisertonib, which FDA has already disapproved now, so it has withdrawn. So in that space, exon 20 insertion probably is the most common one. So if we see 10% of EGFR mutations, which are uncommon, so the predominantly it is, it is dominated by the exon 20 insertions followed by G7719X substitutions. So in exon 18, we have something, exon 19, we have rare mutations, uncommon mutations, exon 20, we have something. Exon 20, we know that T790M, which came up importance because of osimatinib, because most of the patients who have progressed on a first or second generation uh, and TGFR on progression, you do a liquid biopsy or Dr. Sushant said, so in 40, 50% of the patients, you will pick up a T790M. Coming to exon 21, again, l 8 r is the commonest one. And we are today we are probably trying to differentiate exon 19 and 21 as a bad guy and a good guy. In that also, you can have uh, some uh, uncommon mutations like l 861 q or R. So what is now compound EGFR mutations? So compound EGFR mutation means you have a common mutations and also you have picked up an uncommon mutation in the same EGFR space. Second is a two uncommon mutations. A third is two classical mutations. And these compound mutations are a complex mutations. So one classical and one uncommon mutations or one common and one uncommon is the commonest one. So double mutations were identified in almost 14 to 15% of EGFR non-small cell using because of Sanger sequencing techniques. Most of when you do a broad-based NGS poly, you'll pick up this. So this is one study of 60 patients in a in a in a curative setting who have received a platinum based chemotherapy as an adjuvant. So in this, because after the the adjuvant osimertinib trial, now you can see so 25 percent of these patients will have a uncommon mutations, and most of so out of these 25, so these studies are out of 15 patients who had uncommon mutations. So 12 were actually a combination of a uncommon and a common mutations. So uncommon mutations may be undetected by molecular diagnosis. So if you are going for a sequential, so you might miss it. So looking at a PCR, Sanger sequencing, you may not pick up. And that's that's what, um, when this abimantanib um, got launched, so we did not see much of uh, insertion 20, but when it started doing an NGS, then we started picking up this disease. So this slide shows that once you're doing an NGS, so the event, so in those, as compared to PCR and Sanger sequencing, so you'll 
detect more of these mutations. So, so be it uncommon EGFR mutations in a single or even the compound or the complex one. So it go, most of these gets detected on an NGS platform. So that's why in lung cancer, in many other cancers, so all reads, all roads leads to NGS. And we know that. So those who have kept this NGS so it says that this is a white elephant. So unmet medical need related to patients with non-small cell and uncommon EGFR mutation. So this is because we understand that lung cancer is one of the commonest, though in 2020, it rank one has become a breast cancer, but in mortality wise uh, and incidence wise still, so it, it tops a, can a cancer. So 10% of EGFR population is a, such a big, um, a big uh, prevalence of cancer lung that still it makes sense that to discuss and to make more researches, research in this uh, space in lung cancer. So shorter survival during adjuvant platinum-based chemotherapy in patients with a compound or a complex versus a single EGFR. So, so today from stage one to three lung cancers, adenocarcinomas, so you need to do an EGFR and that's after the adenoid tri trial. So you can see that there is a benefit. So it has been seen that if you have picked up a single EGFR mutations, so probably they will do much better if you, than the patients, patients who have picked up a compound or a complex. So single mutations, median was 84, compound mutations, probably the median is, goes down. The compound mutation group had a shorter OS. And that probably can be a negative pro prognostic impact. So now the difference in in, in vitro affinity of EGFR TK for different uncommon mutations. Coming to exon 18, so if you see the deep green, so which is basically a uh, 50% uh, 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 inhibitory concentrations. So if you see the 50% inhibitory concentration, that is IC50 for exon 18, which are uncommon mutations, so probably afartinib outstands, so is, a, is, a, is, is the drug of choice probably from this slide you can see. And in some like G719A, so dacomotinib has some role definitely. Coming to exon 19, again afartinib, in a rare, rare, so we are talking about uncommon mutation. So in uncommon exon 19, again, so afartinib is probably the choice. Coming to exon 20, again, afartinib, and to some extent, you can you still have osimatinib if you, if you are not, uh, if your patients are not affording for drugs like that, uh, abimantam. Um, so exon 21, so again, exon 21, the rare one, so probably again, afatinib and osimatinib is the choice. So from, from if we summarize from this slide, so in a, any rare mutation, so probably afatinib was the choice. And now, now there is an, uh, so encouraging results, even for, with osimatinib. So conventionally, EGFR mutation have been categorized as sensitive, less sensitive, or resistant based on tumor response to first generation EGFR TKI. So uncommon mutations are widely regarded as resistant to EGFR TK, but some subtypes very difficult to remember. So like G719X, L861Q, and S7681 are still sensitive to, uh, so if you have done your NGS well, and if you have picked up this, probably still there is a scope for first generation EGFR in this uh, group of patients. So the median PFS with EGFR TKs has been repeatedly shown to be shorter for in an NSCLC patient with an uncommon versus a common. You can see a PFS in an uncommon is less than seven months, whereas in is almost 11 to 14 months in the common EGFR mutations. So this is from the NEG002 study, shorter OS in patients with uncommon versus a common EGFR. So this was the post-doc analysis. If you see a JEP, my common mutations, so Jeffetinib, 29.3 in the common mutation, whereas in uncommon is almost the half. Even with chemotherapy, though that was much not, not much difference, but numerically again, so the common mutations probably benefited more as compared to uncommon mutations. So outcome with first generation EGFR DKI in patients with non-small cell and specific un uncommon EGFR mutations. So patients with the substitutions mutations in the G719X, L861Q and a 7681 and exon 20 season are reported to benefit from first generation tickets such as alotinib and jepitinib. So you cannot 
throw the first generation out of the box. So we can combine, you can use this drug in combination with chemotherapy. You can use this drug in combination of anti -vagem. And also these are certain mutations where you can still use as a single agent. So outcomes with second generation EGFR TK like afatinib and dacomatinib uh, specific uncommon mutations. So as you can see, so uh, uh, this has shown that this uh, probably this subset of patients uh, have shown benefited with afatinib as compared to the first generation and EGFR. So outcomes with second generation patients with non-small cell with a specific uncommon EGFR mutations. So these are 315 TKI-NA patients with uncommon and compound. Again, fully afatinib stands out to be, and this has been shown in the Lux lung trials. So there's a unicorn study, so which had 44 patients in group A as a uncommon mutations, and group B had a 16 patients with common plus uncommon. So, so this was the complex, and you can see, so overall response rate was 60% uh, with the third generation uh, Median PFS was around 10 months, median duration of response was around 18 months, and median OS was almost two years. So this Unicorn study, which is a multi-center retrospective study of uncommon EGFR mutations, exon 20 insertions were excluded because we have some other drugs for that in the metastatic NCLC treated with osimatinib. Though the patient population was 60, so but at least it makes sense that so not only afatinib, the second generation drug probably, but the third generation osimertin is also doing good even in the uncommon mutations. So real world study of, of second line uh, second line osimertin in EGFR T790 uh, m advanced NSCLC, which is a ASTRI study. Again, it showed that, so these are the patients who have been benefited uh, with osimertin in the second line. And as you see, almost 40 to 50% of the patients will have a T790 on progression on a first generation or a second generation uh, uh, TK. And type two dis time, time to discontinuation was also delayed uh, in the this group. To summarize, EGFR mutations are common oncogenic drivers in NSCLC, especially in the Asian population. The common or the activating EGFR mutation led to dysregulation of tumor cell proliferation and increase the sensitivity of receptors to EGFR TK. Uncommon EGFR mutations comprise a heterogeneous around 10% of the EGFR populations. So it can be from 18 to 21, each with a different characteristic, pronounced impact and sensitivity to EGFR TKIs. So first generation EGFR TKI can be uh, still beneficial for certain uh, mutations as uh, uh, all been discussed. Full data of apatinib shows that this was the choice and now today you have Osimertinib also coming into uh, this category of patients where these are benefiting. So ultimately, all solid tumors and lung, so, so many of our centers either virtually or physically have started doing a molecular tumor board, and that looks to be the way forward for all solid tumors. Thank you. So after all, lung cancer prevention is better than cure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kansan Sir, for uh, beautifully discussing all the aspects of current treatment landscape in uncommon and lung cancer. So before I go to the next talk, I'll add a few more lines. We have recently published, uh, not published, the, um, this abstract we have presented in last year, ESMO, or uh, dacromotinib in advanced NSCLC. And we have eight patients with uncommon mutation where we have used dacromotinib for a median PFS was 23 months. And eight, out of eight patients, seven patients had partial response. So being a second generation uh, irreversible agent for inhibitor, Dacromod is also active, similar like apatinib in uncommon easy fermentation. And there are even very few exon 20 insertion also that is sensitive to the uh, TKI. We have one patient, I can uh, recall the sequence, uh, L763 and 764, who responded beautifully to osimertinib even in easy for exon 20 insertion. So NGS result is very important to find the exact location of this uh, uh, friendship deletion or insertion and mutation and there are mutation who do response to all different types of TK. So there is no blanket treatment for uncommon mutation. So thank you once again for this deliberation. So we'll move to the next topic. Uh, uh, can you give me the slide? So we'll welcome uh, Professor David Planchard. Um, he is joining from France. Uh, I think we all know uh, Dr. Professor David Planchard. 
He is a thoracic oncologist and head of thoracic pathology committee at Gustavo C Center for France. He is an expert in biomarker and target treatment for all lung cancer as well as in immunotherapy. He has been involved in more than the 100 phase one, phase two uh, clinical trial, and he is the principal investigator and the lead author on Flora 2 study and Flora 2 publication. He has published more than 130 articles in, in our uh, international journal. So welcome, uh, Professor David Plancher, for today evening for um, a discussion on uh, uh, this webinar on lung cancer. And Professor um, Plancher will be discussing on the emerging role of treatment strategy in EGFR metered advanced NSLC beyond TKI. So one second, uh, welcome and very good evening and you may proceed. Thank you. Thank you so much for this kind introduction and thank you so much for the invitations. Always a pleasure to have discussions about this uh, population and uh, even if it's uh, virtually, I hope to have uh, next time the opportunity to come in uh, India, but uh, thank you so much. I really enjoyed the two previous uh, talk on the CTDNA and the uncommon mutation. And so I will particularly focus on the common EGFR mutation uh, and just to try to discuss how we can improve uh, PFS overall survival in this population uh, in first line of treatment. So this is my disclosure. So as you know, nowadays, we have uh, to look at the different molecular alteration in our patient, particularly nowadays upfront in first line and in around 50 to 60% of patients, we might identify a targetable uh, molecular alteration and for which we can discuss and to expose patients to specific treatment and particularly patients with an EGFR and sensitive mutation for which uh, nowadays for sure we have a specific uh, treatment. Uh, we have a lot of discussion about the first, second and third generation EGFR TKI and nowadays we know that for sure the third generation did better than the first generation EGFR TKI and particularly osimertinib which was the first uh, to show a huge improvement in progression free survival around 19 months if you compare to gefitinib and erlotinib. It has been shown nowadays also by other third generation Chinese compounds like omolertinib, fumonertinib, and lazertinib, finally, which confirm that you do better with the third generation in comparison to first generation geophytic eye. So if we have the possibility, this is nowadays the standard of care after the goal is clearly to improve the overall survival. And nowadays, only osimertinib have shown in the FLORA trial a significant improvement in overall survival in comparison to the third generation uh, improvement, which is quite nice, uh, around 39 months uh, overall survival in this population. So nowadays, uh, this is clearly in all the guidelines, the preferred option in this population, uh, exon 21 or deletion 19, uh, EGFR mutation in first line. And keep in mind also in the FLORA trial, in the comparator harm, gefitinib and erlotinib, because you can always think uh, to have a sequence of treatment. Uh, you can see in this prospective trial uh, with a nice follow-up of the patient, uh, unfortunately, 30% of patients uh, in the gefitinib and erlotinib harm never receive any second line of treatment. So we know we lose 20 to 30% of patients between each, each line of treatment. And if after you try to identify a mechanism of resistance, you can see it was shown in around 50% uh, uh, T7 and TM mutation for which patients were exposed to osimertinib. So finally, uh, you are not completely sure that all patients will have access to osimertinib because only around 50% of patients uh, will develop this T7 and TM mutation. It was previously discussed CTDNA. And CTDNA, is it better to keep a sequence of treatment and to follow the patient by CTDNA? And if you have the emergency of T70M patient, a mutation of resistance to expose patient to osimertinib. This is a nice European trial that was leading by my colleague Jordi Raymond and Gustave Roussi, for which you had three different harm. Arm A with osimertinib first line, Arm B, gefitinib, and patients were followed by CTDNA every eight weeks. And in case of the emergency of the t 7 and TM mutation, access to osimertinib and Arm C, as we do generally, uh, follow up by CT scan uh, with, uh, and according to the RESIS criteria. And in case of radiological progression, this is tissue biopsy, liquid biopsy, and if patient develop the mutation of recent T7LTM to get access to osimertinib. So do we do better just to follow by CT scan 
or better to anticipate uh, by ctDNA in these patients that receive gefitinib in first line of treatment. Uh, unfortunately, the trial is negative. It has not showed an improvement of benefit, even if patients uh, were followed by ctDNA plus CT scan in the home B in comparison to the classical for up uh, by CT scan. And you can see in this sequence of treatment, it does not appear to do better than osimertinib in first line of treatment, median PFS around 20 months. Uh, this is exactly what you might expect with osimertinib in first line of treatment. So finally, the sequence of treatment uh, do not improve progression-free survival or overall survival in comparison if you start upfront with osimertinib. So that's confirmed that nowadays we know that uh, if we have the access, we should start with osimertinib first line. This is ESMO guideline, NCCN guidelines, uh, which is the preferred option. So nowadays, uh, this is a backbone. This is the standard of care, how we can improve PFS and overall survival in this population. So that means we need um, to try to kill the persister cell uh, or the resistant clone to osimertinib. It might be upfront or this clone of resistant might develop under the pressure of osimertinib and too much just strategy have been developed to keep osimertinib and to try either to add anti-angiogenic treatment, we will see with bevacizumab or ramucirumab, or to add chemotherapy, either chemotherapy up front or sequence of chemotherapy for which you intercalate a GFRTKI and chemotherapy. First option, which make a lot of sense, to add bevacizumab to osimertinib. We have a lot of preclinical data that shown a synergistic efficiency between osimertinib and bevacizumab. It's a Japanese trial. They randomized osimertinib versus osimertinib plus bevacizumab in first line of treatment. Unfortunately, as you can see, it was not showed any improvement in progression-free survival around 20 months and no improvement in overall survival. So unfortunately, a negative trial. If you look all different subpopulations, no specific subpopulations have a benefit from this type of combination, including whatever the EGFR type mutation, deletion 19 or exon 21 or whatever, if patient had brain meds or no brain meds, it was expected to do better in the brain meds, uh, particularly with bevacizumab. But as you can see, it was not showed an improvement to had bevacizumab to osimertinib in this population with G brain meds, which is something important to keep in mind. Second strategy, um, antibody against VGFR2, the ramucirumab. You have one Japanese trial, one Chinese trial on the right and on the left, uh, which have been shown at last ESMO meeting. Osimertinib versus osimertinib plus ramucirumab in first line of treatment in this sensiting GFR mutation. Uh, we have currently the progression-free survival result. You can see in the left, totally negative trial in the Japanese trial, slightly positive in favor of the combo in the ASEAN trial, but you can see the control harm with osimertinib was particularly poor, only 15 months in comparison to the 20 months in the Japanese trial and what we might expect. So we have to keep by kosher. So that means nowadays, not convincing trial, ramucirumab plus osimertinib. So what about the chemotherapy? And for sure, chemotherapy is probably the best option to try to have an efficiency, whatever the clone of resistance, whatever the mutation of resistance up front. The first strategy, which was nice, Japanese trial, a sequence strategy for which you start with eight weeks with an EGFR TKI. Initially, it was gefitinib, and after it was amended for osimertinib, which is now the standard of care, followed by three cycles of cisplatin pemetrexed. And again, uh, you continue with gefitinib or osimertinib. Nice trial, randomized trial. Unfortunately, this trial failed to demonstrate uh, an improvement, um, a significant improvement in terms of progression-free survival or either in terms of overall survival. So no improvement uh, to do this sequential treatment Pediatric eye and chemotherapy, and probably because we need uh, to start earlier the chemotherapy to try to avoid uh, earlier the development of this clone of resistance. So, what have been shown in two trials, uh, you have again Japanese trial and a nice. Uh, India trial, which compare, it was with the third generation of uh, 
Gefetinib versus Gefetinib plus chemotherapy, platinum salt plus pemetrexed in first line of treatment. Uh, and for sure, this is probably the most convincing result, uh, either in terms of progression free survival that was clearly improved with the combo of Gefetinib plus chemotherapy in this Japanese trial and in this India trial. Uh, and particularly because this improvement in PFS translate in an improvement in overall survival in both trials. So clearly nowadays, uh, this is the most convincing data and probably the best strategy uh, in this population upfront. Uh, and so as you know, that's why we have developed uh, the FLORA2 trial. Nowadays, standard of care is not Gefetinib, it's Osimertinib in first line. So in the FLORA2 trial, we randomize Osimertinib versus Osimertinib plus platinum-based chemotherapy, cisplatin or carboplatin, in combination with pemetrexate for cycle, and after you continue osimertinib plus pemetrexate, primary endpoint was progression-free survival by investigator assessment. Uh, patients were evaluated uh, every uh, six weeks. Uh, and as you can see on this figure, it's important because all patients at baseline had mandatory brain evaluation. Most of the patients, 98% are the brain MRI at baseline. So it's important because we know exactly the incidence of brain met in this population. And 40% of patients at baseline had a brain metastasis. So we need to have an efficient uh, uh, combination, uh, efficient strategy in first line in this patient with a high incidence uh, of brain meds. And after patient were followed by brain imaging in case of brain meds. Uh, they had a follow-up every six weeks initially and after every 12 weeks. And the trial, as you know, it was presented and published in the New England Journal of Medicine last year, showed a nice improvement, highly significant in terms of progression-free survival, either progression-free survival, either in terms of investigator assessment or BIRC assessment. And you can see on the left, you can see an early separation of the curves in favor of the combination median progression free survival, 25.5 months versus 16.7 months, improvement of 8.8 .8 months according to the investigator and according to the BIRC assessment, uh, you can see 29.4 months versus 19.9 .9 months with an improvement of 9.5 months uh, in the harm with osimertinib plus chemotherapy, which is quite unprecedented. So this is the best progression-free survival never observed in first line of treatment in this population. In terms of safety, it's a safe. No unexpected toxicity have been observed, which is quite nice. You have the classical toxicity with osimertinib, generally mainly grad one or grad two, and you have the classical hematological toxicity or digestive toxicity related to chemotherapy, but in the flora to trial, keep in mind that finally patients receive only four cycles of platinum-based chemotherapy. So most of the frequent toxicity are within the three months and after clearly it's decreased over time. So which quite nice uh, association, safety association, no unexpected tox toxicity, which is quite safe for this population in first line of treatment. So can we identify a specific subgroup of patients that had a better benefit uh, with the combination of osimertinib plus chemotherapy, I would say no. Currently, if you look all the different subgroups nowadays, all subgroup analyses uh, are the benefit of the combo, but particularly of interest uh, to subgroups, which are generally much more resistant to osimertinib in monotherapy, uh, particularly patients with brain meds. Uh, and you can see uh, that patients with brain meds are particularly high efficiency uh, in the combination harm, uh, osimertinib plus chemotherapy, uh, and also patients with exon 21 mutations. And we know this population generally have a worse pronostic in comparison to the deletion 19 of EGFR. In this case, if you make the combo, they have the same magnitude of benefit in terms of progression-free survival. And just look on the right on the figure, you can see the patient um, when they receive osimertinib plus chemotherapy, you can see a, a nice improvement, whatever brain meds or no brain meds, the same magnitude in terms of progression-free survival, which is not exactly the case. If patients receive osimertinib in monotherapy, you can see patients with no brain meds did better in comparison to patients with brain meds. So that means clearly for patients with brain meds, you improve significantly progression-free survival. And so this is a way to look at these two interest subgroups, which are generally much more resistant to EGFRTKI in monotherapy. 
mutation takes on 21 of EGFR on the left uh, with an improvement of PFS uh, nearly 11 months uh, if you had chemotherapy to osimertinib and on the right patient with uh, brain meds uh, improvement uh, 11 months uh, when patient receive uh, osimertinib plus chemotherapy. So probably priority uh, to make a combination in these two subgroup uh, population. And so after we particularly looked at patients with brain meds, and you can see this is a progression of free survival in the full analysis set on the left that shown an improvement in the PFS clearly with patients with brain meds versus non-brain meds. And particularly if you look patient with evaluable brain meds at baseline, you can see as a ratio 0.40 clearly huge improvement in the combination harm in this brain meds patient with osimertinib plus chemotherapy. In terms of intracranial brain response, this is subpopulation with evaluable brain meds at baseline. You can see on the left, osimertinib plus pemetrex said and cisplatine, and on the right, osimertinib in monotherapy. The most impressive in this population are the complete brain response. Nearly 50% of patients with the combination are complete brain response, which was only 16% in patients that receive osimertinib in monotherapy. So clearly, and that shows you the huge benefit of chemotherapy plus osimertinib in this patient for which you will expect to have 50% complete brain response in first line of treatment, included patient with leptomeningeal disease. We had some patient included in the FLORA2 trial, and you can see here some example at baseline, brain meds and leptomeningeal disease. Generally, these patients are quite resistant with a short median duration of exposure. You can see after six weeks, near a complete response. And you can see here the last follow-up at 25 months, a complete brain response, leptomeningeal response, which is clearly something uh, nice in this patient. So brain meds, leptomeningeal disease, for sure, I uh, would think uh, of this combination in first line of treatment. Uh, do we have a longer follow-up of this combination? Uh, and this is something we have shown at last ESMO Asia uh, meeting. Uh, before to start the randomized trial of the FLORA2 trial, uh, we had a safety run trial in the FLORA2, 15% 15 patients that receive, just to be sure it's a safe, uh, that receive osimertinib plus cisplatine plus pemetrexed, and 15 patients receive osimertinib plus carboplatine plus pemetrexed. So for sure, for this uh, safety run trial, we had a longer follow-up. So we showed updated data. The first thing, uh, we do not have observed any additional significant toxicity despite uh, a longer exposure to chemotherapy and osimertinib in this population, which is quite nice in terms of safety and in terms of benefit. You can see a huge duration of response in this population for which we have a high number of patients that receive more than 40 months of treatment with osimertinib plus or minus chemotherapy, which is quite nice in terms of duration of response. In terms of PFS, you can see the median PFS is not rich in this safety run, but you can see at three years, we have 55% of patient progression-free survival, and also in terms of overall survival, because nowadays we are waiting the overall survival much more mature in the FLORA2 trial, and you can see median OS was not rich, but at three months, at three years, sorry, you have nearly 70% of patients alive with this combination of osimertinib plus chemotherapy. So clearly, it's becoming a new option, a potential new standard of care in first line of treatment. So if you compare osimertinib around 19 months, progression-free survival combination around 29 months, chemotherapy plus osimertinib. Do I need to expose all patients with chemotherapy plus osimertinib? Perhaps no. Do I need to select patients, probably patients with brain meds, probably patients with exon 21 EGFR mutation, which are considered to be more resistant to EGFR tick eye? And further, we will look at, do I need to expose patients with eye tumor burden, patients with ctDNA, any commutation, preference of the patient? So this is some additional data that we will need to have. And we will have this data in the FLORA2 trial to know if we can better select which patient should receive or should not receive this type of combination. What I can show you, the last molecular update data that was presented at ESMO Asia meeting, 
from the Flora Tool trial, we look at the per CT DNA biopsy baseline and when patients progress to try to identify the mechanism of resistance. Do we develop different mechanisms of resistance if patients receive osimertinib plus chemotherapy? The first thing, uh, if you compare here in terms of mechanism of resistance in the FLORA trial, in the FLORA2 trial with osimertinib, we observe the classical mechanism of resistance, the most common were the MET amplification, 14%, uh, the C797S mutation in nearly 12%, uh, and additionally, uh, we observe some BRAF mutation, CARAS mutation, L2 mutation, uh, some red fusion, ALK fusion, classical mechanism of resistance comparable between FLORA2 trial and FLORA trial with osimertinib. If you look patient that receive osimertinib, plus chemotherapy, uh, we do not observe any additional mechanism of resistance. Again, the most frequent mechanism of resistance, despite patients receive chemotherapy and osimertinib, where the MET amplification, the L2 amplification, uh, C797S mutation, and also we observe some CARAS mutation, some red translocation. Uh, and so exactly uh, the same profile in terms of mechanism of resistance, which is quite reassuring, uh, no new uh, unexpected mechanism of resistance. Uh, the things which is important, uh, if you look uh, the number of mutations when patient progress with osimertinib plus chemotherapy, we observed fewer patients with one or higher potential mechanism of resistance with the addition to chemotherapy plus osimertinib in comparison to osimertinib. So the disease, when they progress, they seem to be less aggressive, less mutation of resistance in comparison to osimertinib in monotherapy, which is nice, finally, a more clean disease progression when patients have been exposed to chemotherapy. And so you can look to the tumor mutation burden. And as you can see, it was not increased in the combination of osimertinib plus chemotherapy in combination in comparison to osimertinib, which is quite nice, finally. The disease does not seem to be more aggressive in patient initially receive chemotherapy plus osimertinib, which is again quite reassuring. We have new options and we have some options to treat this patient post osimertinib and chemotherapy. And the most frequent mechanism of resistance, whatever, osimertinib or osimertinib plus chemotherapy, is a MET amplification. And you know nowadays we have nice phase two trial with specific metric I in combination with osimertinib with promising data like osimertinib salvolitinib, osimertinib depotinib, or in combination with capmatinib, nearly 50% response rate when you combine osimertinib with a metric I, which is potentially a nice combination when patient progress with a met amplification in nearly 15% of patients. And potentially, as it was previously discussed, amivantamab, which is a B-specific antibody, which target EGFR and META, it potentially a nice option. To, you know the Chrysalis 2 trial, which combine amivantamab with lazatinib, which is like osimertinib in patients previously exposed to osimertinib, response rate 33%, median duration of response 9.6 months, and so have been developed the Mariposa 2 trial, patient previously exposited to osimertinib. It was presented at last ESMO meeting and published in Annal of Oncology. And patient post-osimertinib were randomized to receive either chemotherapy plus amivantamab plus lazatinib versus chemotherapy plus amivantamab versus chemotherapy, uh, primary point was progression-free survival. And the trial is positive, particularly in the harm of chemotherapy plus amivantamab, or chemotherapy plus amivantamab, plus lazatinib in comparison to chemotherapy. You can see nearly 64% response rate with the combination uh, versus 36% with chemotherapy and monotherapy, and same progression-free survival was improved with the combination either by the BIRCO investigator assessment. The only thing, it was not showed a clear improvement to add lazertinib to chemotherapy and amivantamab, and probably chemotherapy plus amivantamab is enough in this population post-osimertinib exposure. The major issue with this combination with amivantamab plus or minus lazertinib 
either safety and in terms of toxicity. And unfortunately, uh, you have a high rate, particularly in terms of skin toxicity, whatever the arm, you can see between 40 to 50% in terms of skin toxicity, paronychia, rash toxicity, that, that might be an issue for the patient. In terms of quality of life, you have also a high incidence in terms of infusion-related reaction that the first perfusion, nearly 60% of patients have this infusion reaction. And you have also, which is quite surprising, a high rate of venous thromboembolism, 10% with amivantamab plus lazatinib. And if you combine to lazatinib, you increase the risk of venous thromboembolism, 22%, which is clearly an issue for this type of combination. And so finally, uh, interruption, 77%, dose reduction, 65%, discontinuation, 34%. So clearly, it's not an easy combination for the patient, but for sure, it could be a good option, post osimertinib or post osimertinib plus chemotherapy. Uh, so this is in terms of strategy when we are, you have potentially the first generation and third generation with osimertinib plus or minus chemotherapy. And post osimertinib, we can discuss potentially a chemotherapy plus amivantamab. I don't see any benefit to hard laziatinib in this combination post osimertinib. And the next step is probably to better select the patient to receive amivantamab and lazertinib plus or minus chemotherapy according to the MET expression. In the Chrysalis 2 trial, where patients receive amivantamab plus lazertinib post osimertinib, just look, if you look only the MET expression by immunostochemistry, if patients are MET positive, you can see that the response rate is 61%. If patients are MET positive response rate, it's only 14%. So probably we should have a better selection than just look if patients are MET positive or MET negative to know if we can expose to this type of combination. And same benefit, uh, MET positive, median progression, free survival around 12 months, uh, only four months uh, if patients are MET negative. What to do? Either in this MET population, we have potentially all these ADC which are coming, and you have the TELISOV, which is a MET ADC. In this phase one, dose escalation cohort, it was patient post osimertinib, MET positive, and they were studied to receive TELISOV plus osimertinib. So you continue osimertinib, and you had the TELISOV, and in this MET population, you can see promising data response rate nearly 60% uh, with telizovi plus osimertinib. It's a short, it's a low number of patients, so we have to take it by cautious, 19 patients, uh, and we have to take by cautious the toxicity of this ADC, particularly in terms of peripheral neuropathy, peripheral edemia, and blood vision, which is quite classical toxicity when you block the MET pathway. So potentially nice ADC, potentially amivantamab and lazertinib. And so the last strategy, what about the amivantamab plus lazertinib in first line of treatment? And you know this phase three trial upfront that was presented at last ESMO meeting. First line, osimertinib, standard of care, versus amivantamab plus lazertinib. And they also had an arm with lazertinib just to confirm the contribution of lazertinib plus Amivantamab. So first line treatment, untreated patient. And this trial is positive. It's positive in terms of progression free survival. Amivantamab plus lazatinib did better than osimertinib, 23.7 months versus 16.6 months. Improvement of 7.7 months if you combine amivantamab plus lazatinib versus osimertinib. In terms of subpopulation, can't we select specific subpopulation? The answer is no. But keep in mind, that according to the aid, it was not clear to improve the PFS in patient, elderly patient more than 65 years in comparison to the younger patient lower than 65 years. So this is something to keep in mind. And in comparison to the FLORA2 trial, it was not showed a particularly interest in patient with brain meds, no specific uh, improvement in comparison brain meds versus non-brain meds, and also no significant improvement in patient with deletion uh, exon 21 mutation versus deletion 19, which is slightly different from the FLORA2 trial. And the major issue for me, even if you improve the PFS, uh, 
in the safety profile of the combination. And I think this is clearly an issue in first line of treatment for the patient when you see the high rate uh, of skin toxicity included grade three and higher. You can see more than 60% of paronachia rash, 11% paronachia grade three or higher, 15% of grade three or higher, which is an issue for me in first line of treatment, infusion, uh, reaction in nearly 60%. You have the liver toxicity and the venous thromboembolism with the combination, 37% of patients, 37% of patients. So that need, you need to start in addition to the treatment, a prophylactic dose anticoagulation within four months, which is quite uh, not so easy for the patient. Um, Dose interruption, 83%. Dose reduction of any agent, nearly 60%. Discontinuation of any agent, 35%. That clearly show potentially the toxicity of this type of combination, which is probably an issue to use it in first-line treatment. And if you compare indirectly to the FLORA2 trial, you can see in the FLORA2 trial, it's classical chemo toxicity, and we know how to manage this type of toxicity. And particularly, most of this toxicity are within the first three months when patients receive platinum-based chemotherapy plus osimertinib. After you stop the platinum-based chemotherapy, patients continue pemetrexed, and after they might continue only osimertinib. And you can see that gradually you have a reduction of the toxicity over the time. And after patients continue osimertinib in monotherapy, which is not an issue. And in the FLORA2 trial, the median duration of exposure with platinum chemotherapy was around three months. Pemetrex said around eight months and osimertinib around 22 months. So clearly for me, uh, you have a short period of toxicity, classical toxicity with chemotherapy, three months. And after you might say to the patient, clearly the toxicity will decrease over the time. So whatever. So that means nowadays uh, you have the flora trial, osimertinib, backbone, standard of care. Option for me, which is clearly the best PFS never observed with osimertinib plus chemotherapy. Median progression free survival according to the BIRC evaluation, 29 months. And you have potentially the option of mariposa with amivantamab and lazatinib. Keep in mind the toxicity, median progression free survival, 23 months. In both trials now, we are waiting overall survival, which are immature in both trials and hope to have positivity in overall survival that will confirm the new standard of care in this population, and particularly for me, chemotherapy plus uh, osimertinib. Can we do better and particularly uh, select patient? Perhaps yes. Uh, we will have additional data in the Mariposa in the FLORA2 trial, particularly depending on the commutation. So we are looking to the commutation. Uh, can we look according to the dynamic evaluation of CTDNA, the clearance of CTDNA at three weeks, six weeks? It's probably something important. Uh, and to look at new biomarker. And so this is something we are looking uh, to try if we can molecularly uh, better identify this population to have combination versus monotherapy in first line. And lastly, we have all these new generation of ADC which are coming, particularly interesting in this urge fermentation, particularly the air 3 ADC like the patritumab dirixtecan, target trop 2 with like datopotamab dirixtecan. And just look in the tropion pan tumor 01, they included patients with a specific genomic alteration. And in this population, it was mainly patients with an urgent fermentation. Most of these populations were in second, third line, or fourth line of treatment. So, heavily pre treated patients. And you can see with datopotamab dextecan, you have 35% response rate, median duration of response 9.5 months uh, and it was shown at last ESMO meeting the tropion lung 05 only in patients with a specific genomic targetable alteration uh, 137 patients uh, most frequent patients included were patients with an audio fermentation 57 percent of patients uh, were with an activated and sensitive audio fermentation uh, and you can see in this population, heavily pretreated, post chemotherapy, post ejephritic eye, you can reach around 40, 43% response rate and median PFS nearly six months with datopotamab 
Delstecan in monotherapy, so a nice uh, potential option in this population uh, with an actionable genomic alteration. Um, and you have also the patritumab Delstecan, which target not the TRAP2, but the A3, which is overexpressed in 70 to 80% of patients and tumor cells uh, with an NGF mutation. And you can see in this heavily pretreated patient, uh, post osimertinib post chemotherapy uh, response rate nearly 30% uh, median progression free survival 5.5 months uh, and they look particularly according to the mechanism of stent, whatever if it was an EGF dependent mechanism of stent, independent or, or both uh, you can see that the response rate uh, was quite high whatever the type of mechanism of stent, if they receive um, this type of ADC with a patritumab dextecan, either in terms of response rate and also in terms of progression free survival. And lastly, a new generation of ADC for sure will have a specific, B specific ADC, like uh, this ADC, which target EGFR and target A3, which is quite nice. You target EGFR and potentially you target. A3 with this ADC, it was shown uh, updated data at last ESMO meeting, uh, phase one data in the subpopulation with an activated EGF fermentation, previously treated patient, you can see response rate 67% and median progression free survival 5.6 months. So keep in mind for sure the ADC are coming in this EGF mutated population. So if we want to conclude, you can see the complexity, which is nice because we have different options in first line of treatment, osimertinib or osimertinib plus chemotherapy or amivantamab plus lazertinib. And depending which first line of treatment in this population, uh, you will have to decide what is the best second line of treatment. Uh, you have potentially the ADC target met. Uh, you have potentially the ADC that target trap 2 or 3 if you can get access. Uh, if patient can have an access to osimertinib, osimertinib plus chemotherapy, we can discuss amivantamab and lazertinib. And for sure, if patient had only osimertinib, you can discuss chemotherapy in second line treatment or chemotherapy plus amivantamab. And in third line, it might depend what patient receive in first line, second line. So it can be amivantamab plus lazertinib, it can be an ADC, it can be a chemotherapy, it can be a third line of chemotherapy. And for finally, in this population, they might receive multiple line of treatment depending on the previous line of treatment, which is quite nice. And this is why nowadays we are pushing clearly the overall survival in this patient. And we have this patient alive at three years, four years, and even five years when they started the treatment for an advanced disease. And the last update NCCN guidelines, uh, they updated nowadays and to include uh, the FLORA2 scheme uh, with potentially uh, the possibility to treat patient with osimertinib plus chemotherapy in first line of treatment. This is potentially so a new option to keep in mind if you have access to this type of combination. So things uh, are moving really quickly in this transiting adjuvant fermentation, but it's really nice uh, for our patient with an adjuvant fermentation. Uh, and with this, I will stop here, stop my colleague, and thank you. Stop for your kind of invitation uh, and uh, open to uh, any uh, question. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Blanchard, for beautifully discussing all the aspects, including the latest development in this field. So we have panel discussion case based in next session. So any questions for faculty for uh, Dr. Blanchard? Anyone? Yeah, please go ahead. Yep. So uh, good evening and thank you very much for that excellent talk. I think uh, our eyes are much more open now considering uh, the different options that are available. So two questions to you. Uh, you did suggest that uh, while the combination of chemotherapy and osimertinib is a very promising option, you did comment that there are certain subgroups where you think there's greater sense in doing it. You mentioned L858R. You also mentioned some of the co-alterations that are in uh, I, when I was reviewing, looking at the data, I, I was a little surprised that we still didn't have the co-alteration data for the presence of TP53, for CDK and 2A, uh, PIC3, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, uh, uh, can you, uh, you know, uh, talk in a little bit more detail for that? And this second question is, you know, while you've very beautifully laid out a sequence of treatment. What would be your preference for somebody who has a CNS progression on osimertinib with or without chemotherapy? Thank you. Thanks so much for the question. Important question for the committee. Uh, so currently, we don't have a 
showed any data because the process is ongoing because uh, we try to have on ctDNA but also the tissue biopsy and so this is something we are processing but for sure in the near future we will show the data of the commutation if it might influence as you said so that's why nowadays I can you tell I, I cannot tell you anything but this is something important we are we are processing in the flora 2 trial if patients have a brain uh, progression uh, I would say for me depending on the first line of treatment if patients receive only osimertinib, in this population, probably one of the options might be to continue osimertinib and to have chemotherapy in this population. And generally, this is what I do in clinical practice. Either it's a small disease, one or two, and you can discuss sterotaxic irradiation and just continue osimertinib. If it's a multiple brain progression, you don't have access to local treatment by sterotaxic. So in this case, my option, I continue osimertinib and high platinum-based chemotherapy. And what if it's a leptomeningeal disease? Uh, in this case, it's another option. In this case, I might discuss to increase the dose of osimertinib. And you know, if you had, if you increase the dose to 160 milligrams, we have some patients that have a nice, uh, again, partial response. So I, I try to add, uh, to increase uh, the osimertinib. And if enough enough, again, in this population, uh, I discuss to have chemotherapy because sometimes even with leptomeningitis disease, uh, with platinum-based chemotherapy, you might have an efficiency. But first of all, the option, uh, I try to increase the dose of osimertinib. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dev. So the, I have one question. We are being, uh, for Dr. Blanchard, we are being as part of the Flora 2, Mariposa 1 and Mariposa 2, all that C trial. Not much of toxicity problem in the Mariposa, both the setting, first line, second line. So other than the toxicity concern, how do you select between this Mariposa and the Flora 2 in today's time? It's, it's a good question. Clearly, in our experiences, and same, we have participated in the different trial. In the first line of treatment, uh, if I can say most of the patients, we have to stop the treatment and to adapt the dose level, which was not the case in the Flora, tri in the Flora 2 trial. And clearly, we have a lot of experience in, with amivantamab and lesertinib, post osimertinib in second and third line of treatment. And I think this is a wonderful option. So for sure, I would say for the first line of treatment, I would be cautious because for the patient, it's so nice to have a good quality of life for one year, two years, and three years. So I would try to be the less aggressive as possible in terms of toxicity. So that's why for me, if I have the option, it's either osimertinib monotherapy. And I think some patients with osimertinib, it's enough. And they might have a huge benefit with osimertinib in monotherapy. And so that's why we try to better identify this population. Otherwise, with chemotherapy, probably the Flora 2 trial. And I would be much more happy to keep a scheme like Mariposa or Chrysalis trial with Amivantamab and Lazatinib in third line. And it makes a lot of sense because these patients, they mainly progress with the MET amplification. And so in this case, Amivantamab is an excellent drug. And I think in this case, patients are ready to have this type of toxicity when they progress. But in first line, I would say it's quite difficult to have a toxicity like this. And particularly because it's an increase over time. And generally, after six months, eight months, 10 months, the patient, they, they stop, they ask to stop the treatment due to the skin toxicity, the air toxicity. It's quite difficult in terms of. So that's why for me, it would be a OC or OC chemo and keep a second line amivantamab, lazatinib, plus or minus chemotherapy. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll move to the next case-based discussion. We have uh, three experts. Dr. Planchard is already here. And we have Dr. Devavata Arya. He is a medical oncologist from Max Hospital, Sakit, Delhi. And we have Dr. Prabhat Singh Malik, uh, additional professor in medical oncology, AIMS New Delhi. So we have a few case-based discussion. I'll invite the first speaker. Can you move the slide for the Yes, Dr. K. M. Parsarthi. He is a senior consultant and head of the department, Dharamshila Superspecialty Hospital, New Delhi. So doctor, um, please proceed and be in time short because we are running out of time. Thank you. Am I audible? Yes, sir, you're audible, sir. Uh, uh, this is a case that we have encountered last year. Uh, uh, this of uh, both EGFR and ALK positive adenocarcinoma lung. So I'll just go through the slides. Uh, a 66-year-old lady, with a one-month history of cough and uh, dyspnea. 
and uh, she was a passive smoker. This uh, on the pet city, uh, there was a 8.2 into 8.3 centimeter uh, into 11.9 centimeter active lesion in the right uh, lung hilar region, extending into all the three lobes. And uh, uh, there is infiltration of the mediastinum. So, uh, and the, there is another uh, active nodule in the left lung upper lobe also. So, it's a basically clinically before entry MNA disease. And uh, we have done a, a USG guided crooked biopsy. It was showing poorly differentiated uh, NSCLC. IHC was showing PF positive, uh, ALK uh, positive by IHC, and EGFR is positive uh, in the ARMS PCR uh, exon 19 deletion. And PDL1, uh, we have got an institutional SP263, uh, so PDL1 was 5% positive. So it was uh, positive for GFR as well as ALK. MRI brain was showing only chronic ischemic changes. This is the report. And uh, so we had a tumor board discussion. And uh, uh, since she was positive for both the things, we don't um, have uh, some institu single institutional data. So we put on uh, both el uh, electinib, uh, 600 milligram BD, as well as osimer strip. But um, uh, uh, after, uh, after three months, the uh, follow up at CT was showing. Uh, tumor regression, but uh, she uh, she was complicated by interstitial fibrosis, and uh, she was COVID negative, and uh, we treated her, her with oral prednisolone as well as nindidanib. So, uh, so it's uh, as it is a class uh, side effect of alk uh, alk inhibitors. Alectinib was discontinued, and osimertinib was continued after three months. She uh, became symptomatic again, and her PET CT showed increase in the size of the lung lesion and multiple lung secondaries. So uh, it was reported as progression. And uh, since uh, we uh, could not uh, uh, these two together, uh, uh, electinib as well as osimertinib, she was subsequently started on chemotherapy, this platinum and pemetrexid. And uh, as per the uh, Japanese data, we, uh, we added FNIB also. So uh, we are given six cycles uh, till Feb uh, 2022. And follow-up PET CT was showing partial response and no new lesions. And permitrexer maintenance was uh, subsequently given for three cycles. And uh, FNIB was also continued for another three months. After three cycles of maintenance of the uh, metrexid and jeftinib, uh, the patient again progressed. And uh, there is 30 percentage metabolic progression as well as anatomic progression. No change in the mediastinal lymph nodes and appearance of extensive, uh, again, uh, subtural and parenchymal ground glass opacities in the bilateral uh, lungs. Then uh, we stopped jeftinib and uh, one month of uh, electinib was reintroduced uh, uh, as per the patient insistence. We were uh, reluctant. Uh, and uh, electinib was uh, again stopped. We are forced to uh, force, uh, stop electinib uh, because of the clinical deterioration as well as interstitial fibrosis uh, progression. It was patient, uh, patient was put on steroids and support. Again, and uh, we discussed the case with the patient and the relatives, and uh, we told that further ALK inhibitors were not possible in this case. So uh, we have given her four cycles of uh, uh, second-line chemotherapy. Docetaxel single agent data was there, but we added a carboplatin also, and patient had a. Uh, months of partial response after three months uh, follow pet city was showing a partial response uh, and three more cycles of uh, docetaxel and carbo were given 
and uh, after that the patient again progress uh, and we have done a repeat biopsy that was showing alk positivity and pdl1 was less than uh, 1% in that repeat sample patient was uh, put on uh, lorlatinib again and uh, after 3 months uh, patient uh, developed uh, brain secondaries though lorlatinib has got good cns penetration patient progressed on uh, lorlatinib uh, and the whole brain rt was uh, given subsequently and we uh, we, uh, we ran out of options and uh, we suggested uh, Im immunotherapy as per the initial PDL1 uh, high percentage data. Uh, so he was given two cycles of uh, atisolizumab and uh, she didn't respond to that. And uh, uh, subsequently, patient was shifted to ICU and patient. Uh, progressed uh, uh, clinically and died passed away shortly. So that is the case. So you'll have to unmute yourself. Yeah, so thank you, Dr. Parsarati, for this beautiful discussion on this complex case, uh, long history and long treatment. So I'll go to my expert uh, with Dr. Devavat Arya as a first um, expert. So, uh, Dr. Devavat, what is your comment on this case? How do you want to treat in a different manner or any comments on throughout the clinical course? No, I think clearly uh, these commutations are always the difficult cases, the more challenging cases to handle. And uh, we clearly know that uh, the coexistence of ALK and EJFR is a very tricky thing. Uh, I was discussing with Dr. Kumar uh, the combination of uh, the two uh, agents and, and the feasibility of doing it. And I think in our case, the problem has been the fact that uh, the ILD developed. Now, the, uh, the, the other thing I would have wondered was uh, the second biopsy actually failed to show an EGFR, uh, which is very interesting. The first one did show an EGFR. I know it was a, a PCR. The second one did not. So that's quite interesting. I think... Perhaps uh, liquid biopsy might have shed more data. I was a little bit surprised that you had an ALK. You put uh, her on Latinib and uh, she progressed in the brain within one or two months. I think that's a little bit surprising as well. But I think uh, fairly challenging uh, case. Uh... Okay, thank you. So I'll go to Dr. Planchet. Dr. Professor Planchet, do you have any... Uh... How do you treat this patient? Any similar or no? It's a it, it, it's a nice case. It's always challenging. Before to to look at the treatment and the first line option, generally I always try to confirm that clearly you have this both type of mutation because you can have some positive, uh, I would say ALK by immunostochemistry. So that's why generally I push every, every when I can to confirm by NGS uh, and same for the EGFR because I de depending on which PCR you use, but we have this. P technique like IDILA, and we have so important number of pos full positive uh, EGFR mutation by this type of PCR technique. So generally, I try to perform NGS. So that's why when you have this technique, immunostochemistry uh, and PCR positive for EGFR, I do the NGS to confirm that you have this translocation of ALK and clearly this EGFR mutation. And sometimes you are surprised you only found either the ALK or only the EGFR. And also, I try to look at CTDNA because for sure, on the CTDNA, you might look what is the most important cheating yeah. part. Uh, is it the ALK or is it the EGFR to adapt the technique uh, and the treatment? Uh, and probably in this population, what I might discuss in this case nowadays uh, is probably to expose patient uh, as a FLORA2 scheme because uh, you have osimertinib and chemotherapy with cisplatin and pemetrexed, which works well on this ALK population. So generally, I start with this type of strategy. If clearly I have the two mutations that have been confirmed by NGS and CTDNA, and after, if patient progress, I keep in this case alectinib or brigatinib in second treatment. If patient clearly I have another evolution, I perform a new CTDNA and I see the clone ALK positive emerge, I keep it in second treatment. So I try to avoid to make osimertinib plus uh, ALK-TKI because I know it's... Uh, 
generally heavily toxic and I prefer to keep a sequence of treatment if I think I have clearly two different clones of tumor cells in this type of patient. But that's always challenging, I'm, I, I'm agree. But a really nice case. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Professor, any input? Yeah, so I agree. I mean, this is a difficult situation and um, again, very quite rare. Uh, so because of the reality, you will not find a clear-cut answer in the literature. Uh, you have to go case by case, as Dr. Plank have said. Uh, giving an, uh, doing an NGS could be a wiser idea here, which can give you a, a, a little bit uh, understanding which one is the clonal mutation and which one is the subclonal mutation. So based on that, you can uh, uh, follow the strategy of using a combination or a sequential kind of an approach. Uh, here, particularly in this case uh, and this that particular time frame, when the COVID pandemic was there, we were not sure whether it's this infection-induced ILD. I mean, these are some of the confounders. Uh, interstitial lung disease can be due to the ALK inhibitor or can be due to the uh, EGFR right, yeah. inhibitor, so which is a culprit drug. This is, again, a, it's a complexity. So overall, a very complicated case, too. Uh, uh, one point uh, I would uh, uh, say here that... Um, I mean, immunotherapy uh, in these cases probably would be the last choice. And uh, particularly if somebody is already suffering from interstitial lung disease, I would be super careful and uh, would probably avoid uh, using yeah. it. And even single agent, it doesn't have any activity. Yeah. So we have one case in a patient. Uh, it's a rare scenario, definitely. So I think a second conformity like NGS should be one of the area and where you can select VAP, which one is the predominant clone. And we have treated one patient with, I my uh, most favorable goes to one TK with one chemotherapy. And whenever there's a progression, revive, see and select the clone, see which one is demanding and then take a call. But yes, it's easier said than done. So thank you for uh, presenting this um, beautiful case. So we'll move to the next one. We are running short of time. So can you, uh, yeah. So Dr. Preeti uh, is our next um, speaker. He's a consultant. She's the consultant in medical oncology from the Narayan, Narayan Hospital in Jaipur. So, Dr. Priti, are you there? Uh, Priti, ma'am, you'll have to unmute your mic. Uh, so, for want of time, should we move on to our uh, next case? Yes, 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 and yes. Can so come she back. can come, huh, come back later. Yeah, sure. So... Okay, so the next talk will be Dr. Nagendra Sharma, uh, who is the principal consultant medical oncology from Max Super Hospital, Sakit, New Delhi. Dr. Nagendra, are you there? Good evening. Hello, good evening, sir. Hi, hi, good evening. Please go ahead and be brief because we are running uh, short of time. Please present your case. Thank you. Okay, sir. Thank you. So this is an interesting case, sir. I was listening to the uh, Professor David Bankard and all uh, the speakers, sir. I am very much impressed. At the outset, I would like to say thanks for giving me the opportunity to be a part of this well-organized uh, scientific piece, sir. So this case presentation uh, is a unique case which we have encountered in our practice. And 71 years gentleman, and he is from our neighboring country in Bangladesh. He's a non-smoker. He's having comorbidities of diabetes mellitus, CKD, and he already had a DJ stent in 2021. No family history of malignancy. He was evaluated and treated elsewhere in multiple hospitals before coming to our hospital. So May 2019, this patient was diagnosed to be having early stage prostatic adenocarcinoma at Manipal Hospital, Bangalore, is a hospital in South India. Patient underwent RARP, that is robotic assisted radical prostatectomy and bilateral extended pelvic lymph node dissection, and the patient underwent TURBT in Dhaka in 2020. 15th of December 2020, that is uh, nearly three and a half years back, patient underwent bilateral PCN and followed by integrated DJ stenting. 2021, he came to second hospital that is in Medanta where I was working earlier and I diagnosed him that he is having a metastatic urothelial carcinoma, stage 4 and patient has having a multiple metastatic sites, multiple bones, liver, no regional lymph nodes. Patient completed 6 cycles of first line palliative chemotherapy that is gemcitabine and caroplatin along with the bone directed treatment that is denosumab, rankle inhibitor. After which Patient have progressed after a gap of nearly eight months and patient was rediscussing the multidisciplinary tumor board and was started on a second line immunotherapy that is pembrolizumab. So patient has received pembrolizumab second line three weekly 
and patient completed 10 cycles by May 2022. After four cycles, there was a partial response. We continued and patient completed 10 cycles by May 2022. Again, the patient was having a, on the PET scan, there was a perirectal lymph nodes and we had, we had done a tissue sampling from there. So we had done a perirectal lymph node FNAC and cell block, which came out to be metastatic carcinoma. So it was deemed oligoprogressive disease. And we discussed again in tumor board and planned for a palliative RT to this site because these are the only site where the disease was active. So patient have completed palliative RT, that is 30 grade 10 fraction to the pelvic lymph node and the mesorectal lymph node. And after which the disease was silent. This is till June 2022. Patient completed pembrolizumab and demizumab as there was no disease elsewhere. Patient completed 14 cycles of pembrolizumab in Dhaka, that is the capital of Bangladesh. And again, he came with a progressive disease in September 2022. It was a PET NCCT in Mayanta, which was showing a progressive disease. This time, patient was having a new retrocaval lymph node, pre aortic lymph node, and there was an increase in a nodule which was very, very small. And there was a significant incredible increase in the left lung lower low. Patient was also symptomatic for that. Patient was having cup with expectoration and dyspnea on exertion for past three weeks. So everyone thought that probably that this is the, the PET scan final finding, which was in 2022 September, which is showing these are the sites of disease. Uh, there was an interval appearance of a uh, lymph node, which was very small and left lower lobe. There was a new uh, lesion, which was avid. So this was discussed in the tumor board in the previous hospital, and they have thought to treat the lung lesion, the non-regional lymph node, and short course SBRT and continuous followed by systemic treatment. This was the MDT plan in the previous hospital. Then the patient came to hospital uh, where I'm working right now. And uh, we discussed it on our tumor board and we plan to go ahead with a tissue diagnosis from the left lower lobe lung nodule, right? And the, to my utter surprise, the report was, it was a NSCLC, it was a metachronus triple malignancy. So this was a NSCLC adenocarcinoma. We did a IHC, TTF1 was positive. Even pluripotent cytology was positive and pluripotent cytology also we did TTF1. That also came out to be positive. So basically it is a metachronus triple malignancy. One was prostate cancer, adequately treated. Second was urethral cancer, which also was treated adequately and patient was on second line pembrolizumab on which there was a lung lesion, which we had done biopsy and it was a metachronus triple malignancy. But story doesn't end here. We have given one cycle of pemetoxid caroplatin along with denosumab we continued. And meanwhile, we have sent foundation and NGS for this patient. Uh, the first cycle of chemotherapy he received in October 2022 in <coughs> hospital. And this is the foundation and NGS report. The foundation and NGS have picked up that patient is having an EGFR L861Q, which is uncommon mutation. And already Dr. Vishwas have told that the first line TKIs work very well in this type of scenarios also in this mutation. Although the the category one recommendation as per the NCCN uh, and as per the foundation one report was osimertinib and the category two indica indication was afartinib, dacomatinib, perlotinib and jaftinib also the first generation DKI was category two recommendation. Along with that patient is having CCNE1 amplification and TBVD3 H179Q. The pedal one DACO2 to C3 was 0% in this case. So this was the WAF of EGFR. EGFR is showing a WAF of 35.2%, which is quite significant of EGFR L861Q mutation. So basically, by and large, this is what the long story in short. 2020, he was diagnosed with an early stage prostatic adenocarcinoma treated in a hospital in South India, Manipal Hospital, Bangalore. 2021, he was diagnosed with metastatic urothelial carcinoma treated in Mayanta Medical Hospital, Gurgaon. And 2022, he was diagnosed with a metastatic NSCLC adenocarcinoma and on molecular workup, it was found to be having an EGFR L861Q mutant. Patient was in excellent performance status and pain score was 0 by 10. So this is surprising that patient is getting triple malignancies and he was in excellent performance status. So that is what the thing is, what I have learned from this case is that it's not the drug which conquers cancer, it's the knowledge and correct sequencing of the treatment which conquers cancer. Meanwhile, we have discussed in our tumor board and we have planned for tablet osimertinib, 80 milligrams once a day till progression of unacceptable toxicity. Meanwhile, we did a MRI brain. MRI brain later on came out to be clean and we continued on denosumab. Patient also developed secondary endocrinal insufficiency, which was managed adequately uh, after taking consult from the endocrinology department. Uh, we had a strong, a long discussion in our tumor board. Should we continue pembrolizumab with osimertinib and denosumab, whether patient will end up in pneumonia 
pneumonitis as was a deadly complication in back of everyone's mind. But the point here is pembrolimumab was given in this case for urothelial cancer, which is a second metachronous malignancy, which was on the whole by large quiescent. Even prostate cancer also was quiescent throughout the treatment journey. The lung cancer have picked up the patient is having a EGFR mutation. So we started giving osimertinib, pembrolizumab and denizumab. We thought that probably patient may develop pneumonia, but patient have not developed any pneumonia. And treatment journey of this patient is 2019 to 2023. Metachronous triple malignancy. And you'll be surprised to know that patient is eating well, sleeping well, moving around, and uh, is happy. The only patient perspective which I want to share, and I think uh, uh, which uh, you will be happy to listen, that he told Dr. Nagendra, please don't switch the hospital. Whenever you are switching the hospital, I will follow you and I'm getting a new cancer. So please stay in the hospital, otherwise I'll get the fourth cancer. So this is what the patient perspective. Uh, I think my case is loud and clear, right? Thank you, Dr. Nagendra. This is again a complicated and beautifully treated patient. So case... So I'll start with Dr. Prabhat, sir, your comments and inputs. So, yeah, again, a quite difficult and uh, interesting scenario. Uh, here, uh, I would have a little different perspective here. Um, um, uh, this patient has been treated for uh, urothelial malignancy and prostate cancer. Prostate cancer was an early disease and urothelial was a metastatic disease and uh, the disease uh, was well under control. Uh, because the progression which uh, were reported was predominantly due to this new lung primary and which documented uh, based on histology and molecular analysis that's uh, a third primary. So I would be a little scared in combining uh, osimertinib with pembrolizumab. Uh, you have already treated this patient with pembrolizumab for almost one year. Uh, uh, I'm sure this patient uh, must be platinum ineligible because of age or some renal complications. As you mentioned in your big, beginning that he has some DJ stenting, etc. Uh, so that may be the reason. So again, here, uh, adding chemotherapy to osimertinib otherwise would have been a great choice. But uh, here I would be uh, a little um, hesitant to add chemotherapy. And um, immunotherapy... Uh, again, with the fear of uh, uh, that uh, potential complications in terms of hepatitis mm -hmm. or neonitis, I would be a little bit more careful. Thank you, Professor. So, Dr. Plunger, any difference in opinion or so, your inputs? Just one question before we... So, Dr. Naginder, what is the WAF of TPC? Yes, yes. It was 35.2%, sir. Yes. I will show you in the report. This yes. was the WAF. You know, with which with triple malignancies, you'd also wonder what's if there is a germline mutation and a, a WAF could help you. Yes, yes. to huh? the WAF has to be very high for a germline. Yeah. yeah, right. Okay. So back to Dr. Planchard, your comments, please. No, it's a, it's a nice case. Huh? So, uh, that, that that's only mean that we always have to test patient. Uh, probably frequently on molecular level. It's always the issue which technique you use to test this patient. Perhaps he had initially this mutation earlier, but it was not specifically tested on the PCR or something like this, because sometimes by PCR, you test only the most common mutation that you don't test the uncommon mutation. So that's why when you perform NGS testing by tissue and even by liquid like the foundation one, sometimes you found some uncommon mutation that you don't find with a classical molecular test. So I think this is an important message, even for this uncommon exon 21 mutation, but this is the same message for the exon 20 mutation. If you perform only PCR, you might miss around 40 to 50% of the uncommon Jeffer exon 20 mutation by PCR. So that's why by NGS generally, you might discover this type of uncommon mutation. So I think this is a important message on the molecular testing. And the other message, I would be really cautious for sure with this combination of osimertinib and immunotherapy, because for sure in most of the previous trial, you have nearly 30 to 40% of pulmonary toxicity. So just be cautious. And even if you expose patient to immunotherapy, and even if you stop immunotherapy due to the high life of the immune treatment, even if you start osimertinib beyond, you have a high incidence of pulmonary toxicity. So make it by cautious. It's not all the patient and it was the case, but that's why I'm always prudent if patient previously received immune treatment to expose to, uh, to immunotherapy. But the, otherwise, that's uh, 
that's an excellent case. And just to show that clearly we need to adapt uh, line per line. And if we can probably uh, perform between each line of treatment, uh, molecular testing to try to identify a specific uh, mutation uh, that you can, uh, you can target. And even this uncommon mutation, which are potentially sensitive to, to osimertinib. Thank you, thank you. But Avyabrat, you want to add anything? No, I think I agree. It's a fairly complicated case. I would have also been a little worried about combination of immuno with the chemo. Uh, I know stop Pembro here. Yeah, yeah. I would have probably probably stopped pembrolizumab over here and and shifted to osimertinib with or without the chemotherapy. And and as Dr. Prabhat said, one would need to look into the fitness for platinum. But if he were to be Platinum uh, eligible, I would perhaps do it, uh, considering that there's a TP53 as well. And obviously, there would be a case for germline testing for the family as well. The Here, I would like to uh, ask this question to Dr. Planker. Uh, I mean, what was the proportion of uh, renal dysfunction in patient, uh, in Flora 2 in patients receiving chemotherapy? Because that's what we observe in many patients who went on uh, the maintenance pemetrexid, a small proportion do get, uh, uh, in fact, sometimes irreversible renal dysfunction. I would say in the FLORA2 trial, this is something we have looked at, uh, but generally you have 10 to 15% of patients uh, who have an alteration of the creatinine. So that's why the message, uh, in this case, we have to stop earlier the pemetrexid. And so as you have seen in the FLORA2 trial, the median duration of exposure to uh, pemetrexid was between eight to nine months. So that's why in this case, uh, and we don't know exactly what is the contribution of maintenance. Probably the most important uh, is the induction with chemotherapy and pemetrexed. So for sure, if you see that you have an elevation of the creatinine uh, over the time, and this is something we see classically with pemetrexed. Uh, so in this case, probably we need to stop earlier the pemetrexed and just continue the, the osimertinib. Yeah. Right. So you. may I add one thing? Yeah. Here, sir? So I do agree that whenever there is an actionable mutation, we should not give immunotherapy, no matter whatever the PD1 is. Even if it is 100%, yes. we should not give. Right. That's the standard dictum. But right. the point here is, in this patient, pembrolizumab was given for urethral cancer. Exactly. It was second line. Right. It was not given for lung cancer per se. Absolutely. Lung cancer later on got picked up, incidentally. And then the question was, why to stop pembrolizumab? Because patients have a targetable mutation, but it is for lung cancer. But patient was the pembrolizumab was, was working very well for the patient. Yeah, patient was, I'll answer, I'll answer that question. Was, right. So yes, we know all about that. But with uh, after almost a year of pembrolizumab, when the bladder cancer is controlled, you can safely stop that. Most probably, this bladder cancer will remain in control for a long time. There are many study, including retrospective study, and there is one prospective study with capmartinib and pembrolizumab. The study was stopped in between because of toxicity. It is a phase two clinical trial. So our main concern is the very severe intestinal uh, lung disease on osimertinib along with pembrolizumab. So uh, the indication is different, but the interaction is very strong for toxicity. So that is one of the concern. I could have been stopped pembrolizumab and continue on osimertinib. That was the main concern. Okay, sir. okay. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone, for this um, the discussion on the second case. So we'll move uh, to the last case, very brief. Uh, Dr. Preeti is there, and thank you, Dr. Nagender. Thank you, sir. Dr. Preeti, are you there? Very good. Sir, I think Dr. Preeti is having uh, issues. technical with... issues. Okay. Uh, okay. So we'll move on to the closing remarks. Uh, so um, thank you very much. Uh, so, 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 so. I'm very sorry to yeah. interrupt. Yeah. 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 Can we just take that one question, which is uh, which has come in the chat box for David Yeah. So for Dr. Planjab, the question is, how would you risk stratify a patient with EGFR mutation? Negative pedal one versus high pedal one. Does the pedal one expression have any prognostic effect on selection of treatment for Dr. Professor David? It's yeah. a good question. If it's a classical EGFR mutation, there is 19 or exon 21 sensitive mutation. Uh, there is no role in terms of pronostic or predictive value of the pedal one expression status nowadays. Uh, so I would say for me, I don't take care of the PDL1, and particularly even if patients are PDL1 highly positive, you have to target this patient with a, a geophilic eye. And after, if I have to expose to immunotherapy, generally I prefer to expose immunotherapy plus chemotherapy because the probability 
of response with immunotherapy, immunotherapy, except we all have some exceptions. Generally, these patients do not have any benefit of immunotherapy. So no, no pronostic and no predictive uh, factor in this population with, uh, with a nodular flow mutation. Unfortunately, the most important is probably all the commutations that have a pronostic and predictive value. And so this is something we are looking for, CTDNA, but uh, not for the PDL1 expression status. So. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. So I think we are at the end of the presentation. So um, to conclude, to best of my understanding, as of now, with the common IGFR mutation on the backdrop of Mariposa and Flora 2 data, I think we have the uh, least toxic regime and even the Flora 2 with the most effective ratio in all forms of common mutation, including those patients with brain meds and especially in L858 setting. Mariposa 1, the combination, the amibantanol lizardine chemotherapy is also a good option, but with a higher toxicity profile and a brain metastasis effect may not be that great as uh, Flora 2. We can keep amibantanol lizardine if uh, second line and also uh, patient should undergo preferably rebiopsy to detect uh, secondary resistant mechanism and the mate amplification status because we have the data on uh, mate inhibitor, both in the form of Amiantana, but also now the Savona is ongoing, uh, will closely finish. We have data on mate inhibitor TKI along with Osimartinib, and chemotherapy remains as a third line option. There are uh, limited uh, role of immunotherapy, but there are now we know data of immunotherapy and chemotherapy along with Bevasuzumab in the form of BCP is one of the combination in few selected cases. So thank you all for uh, contributing and discussing all these cases and throughout this uh, webinar. Special thanks to Dr. Professor David Plankard for taking out from time from the busy schedule and joining far away from India. So we'll invite you next time to be present physically in India. So thank I you hope. once thank again. Thank you so much. Sir. And thank you all uh, our expert panelists and all the speakers for giving their best uh, time and effort and discussing all throughout this webinar. So back to the organizer for the final remarks and closing. Thank you. So all said and done. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, the Kavina Creations also for bringing us together. And thank you, faculties, for bringing your insights and experiences on this uh, webinar today. And special thanks to Dr. David for joining us. We hope to see you physically for an another uh, scientific uh, meeting very soon. So uh, I conclude the meeting for today. Thank you so Thank much. You. Stay safe. Thank Good night. Thank you. Thank you so much. See you soon. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.